I think most folks have heard of formation flying and uh, you know probably think they have a pretty good I idea or hands on we'll handle on what it is and what's it for. Stick with me on Flywire as we take a look at formation basics. Hi, I'm Scott Purdue and today on Flywire we're going to talk about the formation flying. To really know what formation is all about, well, we need to use a building block approach, okay? We can't, you can't fly at 30,000 feet until you know how to take off. In the Air Force, everyone learns about formation in flight school. Doesn't matter what you fly, the first, uh, you do formation in the first uh, iteration of what you fly. But to a fighter pilot, uh, formation is a tool of the trade. Everything revolves around formation, everything. Everything you do, all your tactics and all that. So here it goes. I could say that uh, the most complex human activity uh, requires a building block approach to achieve any proficiency at the task. So let's start with the basic question, what is formation flying? Well, I think the answer is, uh, is two or more airplanes flying together, and that's a simplistic version of it. Uh, the vast majority of the time, a formation flight is part of a military mission, formations of two or four or even more airplanes flying together to accomplish a particular goal or mission. In some instances, civilian airplanes fly formations as well. Uh, but generally, the reasons are not quite the same. They do photo missions, fire fighting, uh, air shows, or just for fun. It seems to be a primary reason to do it in the civilian world. That's what I do nowadays. I'm not flying fighters, but I still fly formation. Formation flying comes from the military. In World War I, the use of aircraft intimately involved in military operations really took off. Always claim the pun. Military units had been, fly, had been using balloons since the U.S. Civil War for artillery observation and reconnaissance, and balloons were used for the same purpose in World War I when they started using airplanes. The problem with a balloon is that it's not maneuverable. It's really big and it's easy to shoot down relatively, and if you want to use it again, you literally have to tie it in one spot. So enter the airplane, even if for, its, for its day it was pretty fast and mobile. The military use of the airplane was not advanced in the U.S. when World War I started. And besides getting into the war late, Britain, France, and Germany had been uh, basically developing military aviation at a breakneck speed uh, since the beginning of the war. Uh, for the basic business of flying fighters, we owe a lot to the Europeans. Okay, I guess you could say in a way they invented it. Uh, they first used airplanes for artillery support, but then quickly expanded their use to reconnaissance of the enemy lines near the front and then well behind the lines, and then they began using them to attack enemy concentrations uh, with, with bombs, homemade, hand grenades, and airplanes quickly became very important cog in the machine of war. As with any military technological development, the enemy sought ways to negate that threat Air crew began carrying pistols to shoot at the enemy. Uh, they even dropped grenades uh, from the cockpit trying to hit another airplane. They graduated to machine guns uh, on swivels and then you know, they realized that it is exceedingly difficult to hit another airplane with a bullet while in the air. So there's a lot of physics and logistics involved. So both, both sides figured out that fixed forward firing guns machine guns on an airplane that could then maneuver uh, to put the gun into a firing solution uh, was the only real answer. Talk with my hands here. I got my sticks. This was the birth of fighters on the battlefield. The primary purpose of the early fighters was air superiority. Relatively quickly, they were also used against troops on the ground. You know, machine guns are a pretty potent weapon against uh, infantry or even vehicles, even today. As fighters began struggling for air superiority, individual pilots quickly realized that they needed to travel in groups larger than one, and primarily so they have a chance of staying alive more than just a few minutes. In the middle of the year, uh, middle of years of World War I, the average lifespan of a fighter pilot at the front was measured in days, literally. A veteran had been flying for a month. Losses were, shall we say, high. When you're alone, you just can't keep tabs on everything around you, and a fighter by itself is extremely vulnerable. Teamwork means a lot, and uh, still does. The first formations used were a whole squadron in trail, kind of a ladder formation. It's pretty hard to maneuver and do anything with a gaggle like that. 
Quickly, both sides develop the basic formation of three fighters operating together, okay? Basically, just like your fingers, a Vic. They often traveled in larger packs of entire squadrons with Vicks stacked and arranged around each other. And one of the principles of war is the concentration of mass at one point to obtain superiority. Anything over a squadron, say 18 to 24 airplanes, was pretty unwieldy, but it was nevertheless used well into World War II. Some Brits during the Battle of the Britain thought the answer was to the Germans was to a really huge mass formation they called the Big Wing. And it never worked out very well, really hard to organize, and by the time you did, the bad guys are gone already. So once an engagement between two opposing forces occurred, it quickly broke into a chaos of many versus many in a small confined space. Uh, we have come to call that a dogfight, okay? Today, fighter guys generally call it a furball. Furballs are dangerous. Everything happens so quickly that it's hard to cover yourself, much less your wingman. You're basically on your own. A snap gun shot or even a mid-air mid, mid is a real possibility. Just remember this, furballs are hazardous to your health. Doesn't matter how good you are, you can't see everything, even, and your wingman is doing the same thing, so you end up getting stripped. Uh, a more survivable formation and engagement uh, was between two small formations you know, and then, like I said, they started off in a VIC, uh, a three-ship formation. The job of the wingman was to protect the leader so then he could concentrate on killing uh, the bad guys. It didn't always work out that way because, you know, you have a leader here and you have a wingman here when you're maneuvering. <laughs> uh, conflict mid-airs are a problem on your own goal, in other words. In reality, trying to violent maneuver as a three ship was very distracting and often devolved into two airplanes operating together with the third one stripped, uh, or even all three. Collision avoidance between the wingmen is very hard and keeping sight of all the players is nearly impossible. Okay, so, oh, by the way, uh, bombers and transport airplanes often used formations as well for transport formation was pretty loose, but uh, it's a way to mask the lift capability in a shorter time span, and the takeoffs and landings were complicated, but you know you can work it out. Bombers used formation to concentrate uh, their bomb drops, and then take advantage of gunners in the airplane supporting airplanes to keep uh, fighters at bay. So it's for self-defense. The big airplanes still use a basic three ship as their go-to formation. Sometimes very loose by fighter standards. Just a comment. Just saying. Well, in the beginning of World War II, virtually everyone used the basic formation of three fighters, and in the U.S. Navy, they called them sections. A division was made up of two sections. Uh, three divisions were made, made up a squadron. The U.S. Army was organized in a similar fashion, but of course with different names. The British RAF used VIX all through the Battle of Britain in the early days of World War II, and they had begun by then to realize that a VIC was a lousy way to employ fighters against other fighters, but they didn't change it because the, in the press of the battle, it, everything was so dire, there wasn't enough time, they just didn't have time or, or resource to change anything. They were losing so many folks, they had to concentrate on just getting fighters up into the air to meet the Germans at, every time they came across. There was no time to do anything else. But right after the Battle of Britain, they pretty much changed to the Finger Four, which came from the Germans. The Germans used the Spanish Civil War as a proving ground for their new ideas on how to fight the, an air war. The German Luftwaffe developed the Finger Four as the basic fighter formation, one, two, three, four, uh, and then it would break up into two flights of two when engaged. The main idea was that fighters always employed in multiples of two. The basic element of fighter flying is, was, and is two fighters. The RAF and the USAF, Army Air Forces, adopted these tactics, and I think I could make the argument that the U.S. Navy might have developed this two-ship, four-ship idea as their own basic formation independently. Uh, they did use it uh, very early in the Pacific War before a lot of cross-training was, ha or cross-pollination was happening. But they did keep the division of six as the flight breakdown within the squadron until something like the middle of 1943, when they dropped it completely. The technology has developed uh, at blinding speeds, but the basic idea of a formation is still the same as it was in World War I. Mutual support is that basic idea. A two-ship is stronger than being alone. 
covering your wingman is a fundamental tenet of employing airplanes for military mission. This, thus, the common usage term, I mean, everybody uses it, your wingman, you know, got to cover your wingman, etc. cetera. Uh, essentially, it has come to mean your partner, but that's where it came from. Uh, some of you watching uh, this video as part of fly in the military, maybe even fly fighters, and a lot of you are civilians and just think it's cool, and you know what? I'd be the first to agree with you. I think it is cool and a lot of fun. That's why I still do it. It's fun when you get to exercise hard-won skills in an aircraft, in a, in a difficult task, in particular an airplane. But it is decidedly not a game. Formation is a serious business. When you get two or more airplanes in close proximity to each other in the air, things, well, on the ground too, uh, things can go horribly wrong in a heartbeat, literally that fast. Mid-air collisions between two airplanes involve so much energy that at least one, if not both, airplanes crash as a result of a contact. It just happens way too often. There are strict rules of the road that we have to sign up for in order to earn the right to go home after each flight. True. One thing about civilian flying formation is that the reason is not the same as a military pilot. Okay, I said that before. In a military formation is just one additional skill needed to fly the mission, to accomplish the mission. For civilians flying together is the only reason to do it. It's just for fun. There's never a life or death reason to fly formation in the civilian world. And I think that changes things a little bit. Remember what I said about building blocks. These rules are a foundational part of flying formation. A friend of mine from F4 days, a fellow named Brad, Her Brad Hood, said it better than I can, and see if I can get the quote right. Formation is teamwork, and more than any other type of flying, it builds confidence and teaches self-reliance and self-discipline. Discipline is a state of mind, an attitude that knows the rules and the parameters and recognizes deviations and makes expeditious controlled corrections. I think it sums it up. It's really, really a good sentence. I mean, that's the nub of it all. Formation, good, for, good formation flying does not come easily. Collision avoidance is the number one task in formation for everybody, and the ultimate responsibility, uh, you have to pay attention to that ultimate responsibility for each pilot. For the flight lead, you must monitor the wingman during critical phases of flight and be prepared to take evasive action. Okay, don't just watch it, watch him hit you. Uh, more than one formation has come to a tragic end with a rejoin gone horribly wrong, right up there. Uh, Lead's job is to, is to fly, take into consideration things like all the airplanes in the flight, the airspace, the turning room, traffic, the mission, the abilities of the least experienced pilot in the flight. And it is the hardest job to be a good flight lead. And you can only be a good flight lead after considerable experience. Okay, the wingman... His basic tenant uh, in formation is, is you have to keep sight of the leader at all times or the other players. You've got to see the other airplane to avoid hitting it. And if you lose sight, break away from the last known position or flight path into air that you can clear. Learn how to avoid the wake, keep separation, and recognize overtake. That's closure right between airplanes. We're going to talk a lot about that in 201. There are a lot of other considerations, but these are the biggies, okay? You have to have a good working knowledge of geometry. Okay, you don't need to take the cosine of the tangent here, but you have to be able to see and anticipate speed differences and see closure rates. Radio communications, visual signals, what actions you do and when have to be standard. Okay, you can't make things up as you go along in formation. It's just dangerous. For this particular video, it's probably not a good idea to get into those specifics. Okay, so... In the other two series, I'm going to do Formation 201, Basic Formation, and then 301, Advanced Formation. I'll get in a little bit deeper on this, and we'll have references for you so you can take a look uh, at it. Uh, maybe not today up on the website, but we're going to have them. Let's look at what formations look like. What most people think of as a formation is airplanes close together in a group. We generally call that a flight of two or four or more. Uh, more is a gaggle. You have to have formations that apply to a particular objective. There are combat, okay, or operational formations, and then there are administrative formations you use when airplanes are close together in a non-threatening area. 
and how do you keep, keep together and not be a conflict for somebody else and not hit each other. Fingertip, the basic formation everybody thinks about, is, going through, is for going through the weather, coming up initial for the break, things like that. And the basic, it is the basic form, four ship formation. You can do it left or right, okay? You can't have the wingman be in fingertip for hours at a time, so you use other administration formations like root, spread, or fluid. It allows some more maneuvering. Echelon is uh, lined up in a line used to break up a flight to minimize the flight path conflicts, either in the pattern or some other reason. So this is, check out this video of a Vic break to a landing. Do you think that number two on the left here kept sight of the leader? Rob Davis leading his team into a spectacular display. But suddenly everything is thrown off course and he's forced to eject himself Sky from the plummeting plane. It was an extremely loud impact which I could hear above the noise of the engine and my headset. And the aircraft was violently thrown onto its side. Professionalism kicks in and you deal with the situation and in this case to save your life. Diamond is another administrative formation. It's pretty much an Air Force air show formation. I can't think of a single tactical use of a diamond, perhaps to screw up the bad guy's sword on your formation, but then you're too close together to employ your weapons, so it, it's a show formation. Got it. Trail, on the other hand, is a good teaching tool for closure, cutoff, energy management, you know, <laughs> what geometry looks like in the air. Uh, good stuff to know for rejoins, and it's a basic building block for BFM. That's basic fighter maneuvering, or 1v1, air to air. It takes a while to see what is going on and process it. You can't just watch a YouTube video and you got it, okay? Or you do it once in the air. I call formations that I just talked about administrative formations because they're used to maneuver the flight in a friendly environment uh, on an approach, uh, through the weather, etc., traffic pattern, uh, or after the mission as you head home. They aren't good for tactical employment against someone who wants to kill you. For tactical employment, you need the ability to maneuver every airplane quickly and under high G without hitting each other, while, without worrying about hitting each other. And you have to either attack or defend. And in World War II, the basic two ship formation for this was fighting wing. In the jet age, fighting wing just didn't work out very well. And in the US Air Force, tactical, uh, became the standard combat formation. Although I will say that fighting wing evolved into fluid and there is some utility for that uh, as a force ship. But the big disadvantage for the wingman is, is he doesn't get his six o'clock uh, monitored. So it has to be a low air threat environment for some reason. And if for a two ship, I'd say that's probably nighttime. Yeah, if you're doing uh, MVGs or FLIR or something like that. The wall formation is another four ship formation that can be a lot of fun, and you do that to maximize your long range missile shots. You get the sort, not interfere with each other. That's the best way to do it. Eagles love this kind of formation, but it isn't great formation at the merge, and there's not much utility for it in civilian uh, flying, even warbirds, okay? Uh, not, don't have to deconflict the shots. There is two ship tactical. And then four ship, uh, a box commonly known as the container for reasons I'm not gonna go in here. But this is pretty much the standard combat formation in the Air Force. Not sure what the Navy's doing these days. Uh, it is more of a leader, leader engagement concept, okay? So we're basically line abreast and then we're gonna engage that way. Depends on who's in the right position. You can see that the formation is not a simple thing. In, military, in the military, there's a lot to learn here, and it has to become second nature. In the civilian world, we generally fly formation maneuvers that are a small subset of what you do in the military. And since it's for fun, jo folks generally stop at the administrative formations, which in my view is too bad because uh, tactical is a lot of fun, and it is the only way you can build up to air to air, because you know we can still do that. The FAST program, is uh, meant to issue credentials to pilots so they can fly formation in wavered airspace. Realize the sole purpose of these fast organizations is to do formation and air shows. And as such, their approaches are focused on that. There are several different fast associated organizations out there, usually dedicated to one type of airplane, but that is their purpose is flying on air shows. It's not necessarily 
teaching you so you know formation, although they, they think it is. Before I finish, I'd like to mention that there are manuals, there are manuals out there to read and familiar, familiarize yourself with before you fly. Flying is expensive and to maximize your training time in the air, you need to do some homework before the brief. And I'm rather partial to the fighter formation fundamentals written again by Brad Hood. Uh, you can find it on the website. I'll put the link right down here uh, for you to go check that out. As well as squadron standards, you have to have a standard way of approaching some of those administrative formation things and things like that. Well, I hope you liked the video. And if you did, hit like and subscribe. It looks like this a bit here. And I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters here as well. I really appreciate your support. And if you'd like to support the channel yourself, I'll leave a link below to the Flywire Patreon page. Okay, before I go, uh, I do want to get a little deeper into combat tactics at some point. I have a plan for doing that, but I'm saving that uh, for part of my fighter pilot debrief, the historical review series that I'm doing. The next videos in this series is going to be Formation 201 and 301. That's basic and advanced, what it looks like, kind of how to do it a little bit. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.